today we're going to talk about advances in the treatment of cardiogenic and non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema with hyperbaric assisted oxygen resuscitation. This talk is dedicated to my father, who was a veterinarian. Over the first 50 years that I assisted in treating pulmonary edema and acute severe respiratory distress, I have been very disappointed with our therapeutic options. Times have changed. So in cardiogenic pulmonary edema, we have increased hydrostatic pulmonary edema and increased pulmonary capillary pressure, which ends up creating fluid in the lungs. With your typical radiographic appearance of cardiogenic pulmonary edema. In non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, there are a variety of inflammatory processes that are associated with it and end up resulting in the production of said edema with multiple etiologies as listed on the screen. When that neutrophil adheres to the endothelium, it sets off these inflammatory cascades. And to your left is normal histologic appearance of the lung. In the middle is cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and on the right is non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. BNP can help differentiate cardiac versus non-cardiac pulmonary edema. And of course, the traditional treatments are, as we all know, in the acute phase, we try to stabilize these patients. What do we have? We have flow by oxygen. We have mask oxygen. We have an e-collar with plastic wrap. We have nasal catheters, single catheters, and dual catheters, low flow and high flow. But how much oxygen is actually breathed by these patients when they're mouth breathing? What is their actual inhalation percentage of oxygen? Then we have so-called oxygen cages. These are, are aging technology. They are low flow units. They allow CO2 to build up to undesirable levels. And they have a very slow increase in oxygen tension. So it takes a while for them to have any effect on the patients. In addition, heat and humidity tend to build up. The criticalists published a study a couple years ago where they looked at all these ICU oxygen units and they found that there were inappropriately high levels of CO2, even in the units that use soda sorb to absorb carbon dioxide. They said that even with a medium-sized dog, that you might have to change the soda sorb every 30 minutes, which is totally impractical. So we have a medium-sized unit, dual-purpose hyperbaric free-flow oxygen, and then we have the large size unit with the, that can hold the Great Danes with dilatative cardiomyopathy. These units are dual purpose. They can perform as a hyperbaric oxygen therapy unit and they can perform as a free flow ICU oxygen unit. The large unit can flow at 450 liters per minute. The large unit has about 841 liters of volume of gas and therefore you can see that in less than two minutes, you can flow in that more than that same amount of volume in, as 100% oxygen. So you have a very rapid administration of your oxygen treatment. In these units, you can measure oxygen concentration, humidity, temperature, and carbon dioxide parts per unit. And you can control them by adjusting the flow rate. On the left, is a patient breathing oxygen at sea level. On the right is a patient breathing oxygen under pressure. The small white round bubbles demonstrate the oxygen that's actually dissolved in the plasma. Under sea level pressures, very little oxygen can dissolve in the plasma. Under hyperbaric pressures, a very large amount can dissolve in the plasma and thus be delivered to the tissues of the microcirculation in distress. This is a patient in the hyperbaric chamber with a transcutaneous oxygen monitor. That monitor is a, simply attached to the skin with a lead, and it demonstrates the, the levels of oxygen that can be attained under the different treatment conditions. 
breathing room air at sea level, you can see that we can reach 99 millimeters of mercury. Breathing 55% oxygen at sea level, which is standard for an ICU oxygen unit to be used over a long period of time, we can reach 182 millimeters of mercury. Breathing 100% oxygen at sea level, we can reach 340 millimeters of mercury. But when we move up into hyperbaric oxygen therapy, at 1.5 ATA, we can reach 1061 millimeters of mercury, and at 2 ATA, 1368 millimeters of mercury. So that you can see, at sea level, no matter how you deliver it, you're only going to be somewhere between 99 and 340 millimeters of mercury to these critical patients. But when you move into the hyperbaric mode, you can give over a thousand millimeters of mercury more to help pay down that oxygen debt and supply the vital tissues. So here we have a typical 10-year-old small brain canine in respiratory distress. It presents with acute cyanosis, a loud heart murmur, and very loud pulmonary lung sounds on auscultation. This is your typical congestive heart failure patient. Of course, typically we will give it furosemide. There's our pre-treatment radiograph, and you can see the very large heart and the pulmonary edema pattern. This type of a patient we will immediately place in the chamber after giving the diuretic We'll take it up to 2.0 ATA, 100% oxygen. When the patient stabilizes, we can then back down to 50 to 60% oxygen in the free flow mode by throwing a single switch on the chamber. If the patient decompensates, we can go back into the hyperbaric mode until we adjust our medications and get the desired effect. We typically do not give more than six hours of hyperbaric treatment in a 24 hour period and we will give four hours in between major hyperbaric sessions at free flow of 50% oxygen to give it an oxygen break. There's your post-treatment radiograph in which there's a very large left atrium, but the pulmonary edema is resolving. In non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, there is no evidence that any drug is effective at treatment. <clears throat> However, the hyperbaric chamber down-regulates the inflammatory cascades that we touched on earlier, which are associated with non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And at the same time, it is reducing that inflammation. It is supplying oxygen via the plasma to satisfy aerobic metabolic needs. Here's a puppy, fell out of a kayak, had a near drowning was resuscitated. This puppy was treated with furosemide by the primary care doctor. However, overnight it did not improve. The next morning it was brought into the hospital. It was giving one treatment of hyperbaric associated oxygen resuscitation. And we see the results. Here's a lab with laryngeal paresis and associated with non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Before this dog was put into the chamber, it was in an orthopnic position, in extreme respiratory distress, and had been that way for nearly 12 hours, according to the owners. About 10 minutes into the chamber, you can see still the bubbles from the pulmonary edema, but the dog was finally able to re rest and breathe comfortably. This is a puppy that was tied to a tree. The leash created a strangling and we had an associated non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. This is after one treatment of hyperbaric assisted oxygen resuscitation and the pulmonary edema has cleared. And here's a puppy that fell into a swimming pool and it has non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema pattern again on the radiograph. Here's your post hyperbaric assisted oxygen resuscitation. Those of us that do hyperbaric oxygen therapy, we all have the cat fire cases. And here's the cat coming out of the house fire. Upper left picture shows you the foam from the non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. The radiograph pre shows you the non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. The right upper picture shows you the thermal burn wounds. 
And of course, the cat also is very painful and has elevated carbon monoxide in its blood due to carbon monoxide toxicity and inhalation. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy in this case is able to, one, reduce pain, no susceptic pain, neuropathic pain, pain of inflammation, and pain associated with arthritis are all proven to be beneficially treated with hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Number two, the carbon monoxide half-life is taken from three hours to 23 minutes with hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Number three, the thermal burns and the wounds are treated with hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And number four, after one treatment in the hyperbaric chamber, we see that the non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema has resolved. Thank you very much. To find out more about Secrets Veterinary Health full line of veterinary hyperbaric products, please visit us at www.sivethealth.com. Our team is standing by to serve you.